started uh, this week, and uh, we're starting with John chapter 10 today. Uh, any questions from what we read last week or the week before? We didn't have Sunday night last week, did we? Any questions thus far in John? I guess I should phrase it that way. Last time we were together, I think we talked about John as a whole. Is that right? Okay. Well, John is definitely different. And uh, I'm enjoying John. I'm getting a lot out of John this time that I don't remember seeing in John in previous times. Um, Some of that's good. I enjoy that. Some of that is not so enjoyable. uh, But it's uh, good anyway. Um, As we get started tonight and we look at... uh, the first story that we started with today in John chapter 10, the story of the Good Shepherd. Now, in biblical literature, we have a couple of different types of stories that Jesus tells us. We have parables. We're familiar with parables. We've read a few parables over the last couple months. There are parables that typically have one point. They're, they're kind of brief succinct to the point they tell a story then we have allegories which have more than one connecting point but they're still fairly brief and then we have what we're going to start with the good shepherd and we'll find in the the vine in john chapter 15 we have longer teachings that don't quit fit the category of parable or an allegory uh, the greek word for this is a mashal or a Hebrew word for it, is a mashal. It, it's, a, it's a long story that tells many points. So as we start reading this, and as we look at this, I want us to understand that it's not going to be a simple, oh, that's the point of that. There's going to be a number of light bulbs that can go on as we're reading this, uh, this section. Um, and the same with, with the vine in John 15. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to these stories that, um, that deserve... Um, extra attention. As of right now, this is where I hope that I get to preach next Sunday, but I don't always get to preach where I want to preach. Um, The Good Shepherd. When we look at this story, um, Jesus says that he is the good shepherd. Now, good is a qualifying word there. And if he just said, I am the shepherd, then there would be some eyebrows raised. Okay? Okay. There's a difference between a good shepherd and a shepherd. Um, Shepherds were not the best characters. They were those of ill repute. They were the ones that couldn't find or keep a job elsewhere, and so they ended up in the fields with the sheep. Um, Which makes the announcement of Jesus' birth to the shepherds, as recorded by Luke, all the more amazing. Why did the angels go to this group of characters? He went to show them that everybody qualifies for this gospel. Not just the elite. Everybody. Shepherds were very close to their sheep. Now, let me ask this question. Any of you raised with sheep? Have sheep growing up? You had some sheep? You raised sheep for a while? About how many did you have? And how long did you have them? <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. So you had them for a couple years, maybe? Okay. Um, so your purpose in having them was not for meat or for wool, it was just grass control. When you were working at John Deere, didn't have the time to, to mow everything, right? Um, shepherds typically were very close to their sheep in this era. Um, in, in some areas, sheep are raised for meat. Um, in Palestine, the sheep were raised for their wool. And so it was, it was something that they would, they would raise the sheep... And they would have them from birth until natural death. And I don't know what the life expectancy is for a sheep, but it's a number of years that they would have these animals. Depends on how close they got to the fence, right? Um, And and sheep aren't known as the most intelligent animals. Sheep are rather stupid in a lot of ways. 
Um, if, if one sheep jumps off of a cliff and breaks its neck, you're going to have at least five go after it before you can get them stopped. They just kind of <laughs> keep going, following one another. Um, so it's interesting that Jesus uses this parable or this, this mashal to refer to us as sheep. Um, <laughs> I'll let you read into that what you want to. Um, and you can point fingers or elbows or whatever. But um, The shepherds would spend 24-7 with their sheep. And, and as evidence with you guys, if you would have been there 24-7, the sheep would have been okay. They would have survived, but they're not the kind of animal that you can just leave on their own. Somebody has to be with them. Because if you're not with them, there are a number of things that can happen. Number one, they can get their head stuck in a fence, and they can suffocate themselves. Number two, easy prey for, for coyotes, um, or wolves, or bears, or lions, or whatever it is in, in the area. They're easy prey. So shepherds, in order to protect their sheep, were with them 24-7. They knew better than to leave the sheep unattended. Um, at least not for long periods of time. They did go and see baby Jesus, but they went right back. And I'm guessing the sheep were sleeping when they went. They knew the intricacies of their sheep. It's almost like the sheep were their children. They knew how their children responded to different things. They knew which sheep was most likely to venture off in this direction. They knew if, if they, they could start to distinguish the sheep's cries from one another because they were with him so often. And the sheep knew their shepherds. Just like children grow to know their parents, the sheep grow to know their shepherds. Um, the shepherd's tools... I just want us to understand some of the tools that the shepherd would use. Um, The first would be his scrip or the bag in which he would carry his food. Um, But the second tool that the shepherd would use would be a sling. Now, where do we know the shepherd's sling from? David. Right, David, when he was a, a shepherd boy, used his sling to do what? Kill the giant. How big was Goliath? Nine feet tall? The Bible says he was over nine feet tall. That's pretty big, isn't it? Um, and he killed him with what? A stone. A stone. Cut his head off. Yeah. Yeah, we leave that part out of the kids. Um, <laughs> um the sling could be used to defend against robbers. Um, robbers would come and try to steal sheep at times. Um, it would be used to defend against animals. David said he had killed a lion and a bear. He was very well used to using his sling. Um, but it was also, I found this interesting, it was a way to call the sheep back if they were wandering too far. Now, David was an expert with his sling. Because when you're out with your sheep 24-7, you've got plenty of time to practice. Because while you've got to be there, because they're going to do something stupid, it's not like you've got your hands on them all the time. And so the rest of the time, you're filling your time, and shepherds would become amazing marksmen with their slings. They would use the slings when, they're, um, when, they're trying, when the sheep are wandering too far. If they didn't want to chase after this one, because then these would go running that way, they would, they would use the sling... And they could get it pretty close to the sheep's nose. And just enough to catch their attention and scare them or or hit right in front of them and make them jump and turn around and run the other way. I thought that was an interesting use of the sling for the shepherds. So the sling was an important tool. Second, or the the next one was his staff. In, In Psalm 23, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They're two different tools. Now, the rod... Is, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But the staff, um, what do you think of when I say staff? Okay, that's actually the rod. So what do you think the, the staff would be? A walking stick? It's actually a bully, bully club. The, the, it's a short, stubby stick 
hang from, from leather by his side. And a lot of times they would put nails in them, have nails coming out the side of it. That's, that's the staff, is what my commentary said. Maybe I'm wrong, but I could be wrong. It could be. It very well may be. I don't know. That's just what one of my commentary said, and maybe I wrote it down wrong. I've been known to do that, too. Anyway, one of their tools, um, and it was used to defend against animals and robbers as well. So he had one that was the long, crooked thing, but he also had one that was just there for a weapon. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now we understand the next one is that rod or staff, whichever one you want to believe, and I don't care, um, the shepherd's crook. It's the one that has the, the hook at the end, and when the sheep's going, he doesn't have to bend down and grab him. He just sticks his rod or staff out and grabs it, pulls it back. Um, every night when the sheep were going into the fold, the shepherd would take the crook. How about I call it a crook instead of a staff or a rod? And that way I'm, he would take the crook and he would hold it down close to the ground. And every sheep would go underneath of the crook on its way into the fold. Okay. It wasn't just mass chaos letting them into the fold. It was every sheep would go through one at a time. And in so doing, he was able to inspect the sheep to make sure that they hadn't gotten injured that day, to make sure that they didn't have any illnesses going on. It was that time where the shepherd got to know every sheep. Before they would go to bed, they would pass underneath of the crook. That one is actually referenced in this, um, in this story, somewhere, maybe, um, anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheephold rather than going through the gate must surely being, be a thief or a robber. Um, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And, and it's that process of going through the gate that he would use his crook to, to do. Um, the most um, powerful tool, tool, though, that the shepherd have, anybody guess what that is? His voice. The shepherd's voice was the most powerful tool that he had in working with his sheep. Because the sheep could recognize the shepherd's voice. Sheep would follow their shepherds. Now it's interesting because in those days, very few shepherds had their own fold. They would, in mass, come together, put their sheep in the fold at night. And then in the morning, how do you think they separated those sheep out? They didn't have tags. How do you think they separated the sheep? By voice. One shepherd would go over here, one would go over here, and one would go over here, and they would do their call, and the sheep would just line up and go to their spots. Yeah, because they're stupid. (laughs) Or smart in this case. One of the commentaries that I read a couple of years ago on this passage, and I don't remember which one it was, said that he was visiting Palestine and he was watching as the sheep were going uh, crossing the road and he had to stop to allow them to cross the road. And three or four shepherds came together at the same time and they were crossing the road and he was sitting in the car thinking, how in the world are they going to separate those sheep when they get to the other side of the road? Because they're all mixing in together. And he said, I sat with amazement as they just went to separate areas and called and the sheep just immediately went to the right shepherd. Um, The sheep follow their shepherd. This brings us to a concept of eternal security. This passage where it says no one can snatch them from the Father's hands in uh, John chapter 10 verse 29 um, that, this is a passage that has been used quite extensively 
to support the concept of once you're saved, you can never lose your salvation. And I believe in eternal security to the point that we can be secure, we don't have to be worried about it, as long as we are following Jesus. The qualifier to this in my mind is not that no one can snatch us out of his hand. But the qualifier is the shepherd can only take care of the sheep as long as they hear his voice and follow them. And he says, um, my sheep listen to my voice, verse 27, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. The eternal life comes as a result of them knowing his voice and following him. You cannot separate the two. If you are not following Jesus, then this passage cannot be used to say, oh, well, then you can do whatever you want to and still go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, you follow me, and I will give you eternal life. There's a relationship, and it's not, it's not a matter of, of just, uh, just I, I said the prayer, so I'm good to go. Um, There is a relationship that's involved here. Any questions on the Good Shepherd before we move on? Mm hmm. Yep. Mm hmm. And Jesus tells us in this passage that a good shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep. A hired hand, on the other hand, will run when the wolf comes, but a good shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep, and Jesus lays down his life for us. Well, to me, this is the difference between listening to Jesus' voice and listening to Satan's voice. Right. He's, he's saying, um, he starts out this passage, I think it was today's reading, um, anyone who sneaks over the, the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber, which tells us that there is someone trying to get us out of there the wrong way. Um, and it tells us that you can get out of the sheep pen <laughs> the wrong way. So it is a matter of what voice are we going to listen to. His sheep know his voice, and they follow him. Well, if you haven't read the Bible in the first... you ever read that in the Bible, Abel was a shepherd. Yeah, most of the, most of the uh, biblical characters have been shepherds. Um, Abraham and all of his children were shepherds. When um, Joseph brought his brothers into Egypt, before they went to meet Pharaoh, what did he tell them? Don't tell them what you do. <laughs> Don't tell him you're shepherds. Tell him you're, you, you own land, uh, livestock. Um, yeah, most, most of the biblical characters have been shepherds. David, Moses. And a part of that is the wilderness experience you're able to listen for God's voice when you're out in the open, out alone. When we're constantly going, and I shared this morning in my sermon, it was last night at 1230 that the Lord started speaking to me. And it wasn't, Jack, as I was praying this morning, I I told Jack and Bob that, and Jack said, why does the Lord ever speak to you earlier than that? And I said, well, I'm usually too busy. Um, I'm, I'm not quiet enough to listen. And, and there's a lot to be said for us being quiet and being able to go out into a place and just listen. And, and to, to be in the solitude, in the quietness. God can teach us a lot. But our culture does not set us up for solitude. We've got music going. We've got something going all the time. Our culture is not very friendly to solitude. The next story that we look at is kind of... Um, it's a powerful story, but it's also a big deal um, in that it's the last miracle recorded in the book of John. Now, what chapter are we in? Chapter 11. How many chapters is John? 21. 21. So other than Jesus' resurrection, we're not going to see any more miracles. Now, when we look at some of the other Gospels, I mean, Mark was just plugged full of healings and this... John only had, I think, eight miracles. And by chapter 11, he's done, with the exception of the the resurrection. So 
that tells us that things are going to shift when we get past this. Actually, it's next week that it's going to shift. Um, but this week, as we read this story, this is our last miracle of Jesus, because this is our last gospel to read. It's the last miracle other than the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, the disciples perform a few miracles, but it's going to be our last miracle till next year. Cry when you read that. But it was, in, in essence, it was the straw that broke the camel's back for the Pharisees. Now, we've read in the other Gospels, and we've talked about the fact that Jesus really started pushing buttons when he gets into Jerusalem. This miracle is the miracle that pushed, I mean, this was Jesus jumping up and down on the Pharisees' buttons to saying, you've got to kill this guy. Um, and John references this at the end of, of several different stories. He'll re- refer back to this and say, because of Lazarus, they felt like they had to kill Jesus. Jesus wanted to show his power over death. So he didn't act immediately. Um, when Jesus first gets the word about Lazarus, in chapter 11, verse 4, he says, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory for this. So although Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Although he loved them, he stayed where he was. And not just for a night or a day, but two days. Which means that by the time someone had brought him news of Lazarus. It's a one-day journey. Lazarus died while that person was still in transit. Jesus waits two days. By the time Jesus gets there, it's the fourth day. Now, why is the fourth day significant? Anybody know? The fourth day was significant because in the Jewish culture... They believed that the soul would hover over the body for three days and then depart. Jesus waiting four days ensured that this was indeed a miracle. How many of you read a couple of weeks ago in the the news or saw in a news story, um, there was a, a man in Egypt who woke up at his funeral? They did not have the technology in that day to determine if someone was still alive. If you couldn't feel a pulse and you couldn't see them breathing... They were dead. Even though someone could breathe shallow enough to still be alive, but to not be detectable. We saw this some in the war, where they would, you would have casualties, you would think they were dead, and they weren't. Um, they, there was a case recently where they thought a baby had died, and they found the baby was still alive. There are a lot of these stories, but you can only survive a certain number of days if your breathing is that shallow. It can't go on indefinitely. And the Jews had known people who, three days, they came back to life. Well, they woke up. They didn't come back to life. They they weren't dead yet. So a part of what what Jesus was doing here, the waiting the fourth day, was enough to say he wasn't just sleeping. Now, he told his disciples he's still sleeping, but he can't sleep that fourth day. He wasn't just asleep. He waited long enough to make sure that they would know that this was indeed a miracle. This raising of Lazarus, as amazing as it was, led into the plot to kill Jesus. Um, This uh, really pushed the Pharisees over the edge. Um, It leads us to an interesting part of the, uh, the Jewish culture of that time. It... The ESV actually tells us that he went, they, they called a meeting of the high priests. The in New Living Translation translates that leading priest, but the Greek actually says the high priests, plural. Now, how many high priests were there? In the Old Testament, how many high priests are there supposed to be? One. High priest. Means he's in charge. High priest. Not two. How long was someone appointed to be high priest? It was a lifetime appointment. How could there be two two high priests? In the Jewish culture, the Jewish Roman culture of that day, 
Um, the position of high priest ceased to be a spiritual position and became instead a very political position. Um, Around the time of Jesus' birth, uh, shortly after Jesus' birth, a man named Annas was appointed as high priest. He was appointed as high priest, and I think he served for seven or eight years. Um, And then a new governor came in power that didn't like Annas and removed him from power. Now, in the Old Testament setting, that would be unacceptable for someone to remove a high priest. In the Roman culture, they'd actually been doing this off and on. After Annas, there were two other short-lived high priests. Both served about a year. They kept getting removed. And finally, um, Annas got his son-in-law the job. And uh, after he had been removed from power, he worked the system and got his son-in-law in the position. Now, it then becomes a family business. And in a family business, kind of like the mafia, um, dad still makes the final call. So they got together a meeting of the high priest. In fact, in Jesus' trial, we're going to see that before Jesus goes before the high priest Caiaphas, he goes before the high priest Annas. Okay? So we see this, um, this political structure showing up, and I don't want you to be confused by that. Um, so they go before Caiaphas. Now, I want us to think about when we're, when we're reading this stuff, How did John know this? How did John know what took place in this conversation between the high priest? You ever wonder? It does. John, the fisherman from Galilee... John, who had been a disciple of John the Baptist, somehow had gotten connected with Caiaphas. We don't know how. This story is uh, is explained in, in John chapter 18, if you want to turn there with me. Um, this is actually referring back to... Uh, um, the, the story we're, we're looking at here. So the soldiers, their commanding officers, and the temple guards arrested Jesus, tied him up. First they took him to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, Caiaphas, the high priest at the time. Caiaphas was the one who had told the other Jewish leaders, it's better that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of the disciples. That disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching at the gate, and she let Peter in. Isn't that interesting? How in the world did a farmer or fisherman from Galilee end up connected with this mafia family? I don't know the answer. Nobody seems to know the answer, but it's interesting. So the story that we're going to look at, the plot to kill Jesus... Somehow, John got from Caiaphas this information about what this conversation was. Now, do you think that after, when Caiaphas is plotting to plan Jesus, to kill Jesus, do you think he's going to then turn around and tell John in a friendly conversation, oh, that guy you've been following? Here's what I said about him? It's interesting, but it should make us think, how in the world did this information get in there? How did John get this? Caiaphas was actually the high priest for a couple of years after Jesus' death. Um, He was from 18 um, A.D. to 36 A.D. Jesus died in 33 A.D. So for three years after Jesus' death, Caiaphas was in in charge. So anyway, um, that's some good information for you to think about. Caiaphas was prophetic without knowing it. And um, John talks about this in chapter 11. You don't realize... Actually, if you start before that, the, the literal translation of this, um, starting in verse 49, says, Caiaphas, who was high priest at that time, said, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't you love it when people start conversations that way? <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Then he says, you don't realize that it's better for you that one man should die for the people 
than for the whole nation to be destroyed. Now, what did he mean by that? We interpret it one way. We interpret it, and John interprets it. Um, He did not say this on his own as high priest at the time. He was led to prophesy, saying that Jesus would die for the entire nation, and not only for that nation, but to bring together and unite all the children of God scattered around the world. That's how we interpret it, as John interpreted it. But what did Caiaphas mean? You see, his motivation for killing Jesus was this troublemaker is going to get Rome's attention, and we're going to lose everything. Or I'm going to lose everything. Because if I can't keep control of these Jewish people, they're going to remove me from high priest and put in somebody that can. It's better that one man die for all the people than my livelihood be taken away from me. Then we transition into Jesus being anointed. Um, John gives a name to the woman that anointed Jesus. The others didn't give her a name. The others just said a woman of ill repute. The other um, Gospels fill in the details that she was not the nicest person. She wasn't the girl that you would bring home for your high school prom and say, Look, Dad, there's a country song about that. Um, anyway, this, uh, this upset the disciples. Um, we, we read when we read this story in, in uh, Luke that this upset everybody in the room. Why was Jesus allowing this woman to do that? It upset the disciples. Now, the the argument that the disciples gave was what? Why are you letting this woman waste this? She could have sold this and given the money to the poor. Now, who said that? Judas. Judas. Why did Judas say that? Because he carried the money purse. And John, I don't think John liked Judas very well. Since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. He was very much in love with money. At the end of this story, we see another detail come out, that the plot to kill Jesus grows. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priests, Caiaphas and Annas, decided to kill Lazarus too. For it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Now it gets stickier because now it's not just one man they're going to kill, but they're going to have to kill Lazarus as well. Now we know that eventually Lazarus died. But can you imagine what his family is dealing with as they're hearing these plots to kill Lazarus? We just buried him. We just went through the funeral. And now they're going to try to kill him again? How many of you read the story or heard the story or watched the, I think they've got a movie about it, the case, I think it was Taylor University, where they had uh, a case of mistaken identity and a death. They buried the wrong girl. I mean, one had died and they... The wallets had flown in this van accident to where they misidentified, and they told them that the faces were going to be swollen. They looked similar. Um, they buried the wrong girl, or at least they put the wrong tombstone. Um, and when the, the one that was still alive came to and said, no, I'm, I don't remember which one she was, I'm Lauren or, or whatever, um, there was some major confusion on behalf of the family because, wait a second, this isn't our daughter. We thought it was. We've been sitting by your hospital bed for... But anyway, then they had to process that funeral. They thought they'd been grieving, but then they had to, oh, our daughter died months ago. Imagine what this was like for Mary and Martha. Okay, we've lost Lazarus once. Jesus came back amazingly, raised him from from dead, and now we're going to lose him again. All because the Pharisees are... Upset because people are following Jesus or following Jesus and not them. Hey Bob, a screw went through here. I just found that. Note. (laughs) 
I, I know you're in for me. You know I sit there. All right. I just happened to look down and see that. Our communion racks, there's a screw that came through. So um, anyway, the next section that we see is one of, it's a section that I don't like. Um, it's a section where Jesus refers back to Isaiah's um, prophecy, or John ties in Isaiah's prophecy. The people couldn't believe, for as Isaiah also said, this is chapter 12, verse 40, the Lord has blinded their hearts and hardened, or blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. Does that bother anybody? Why would God harden their hearts? And then John explains this passage in a way that makes sense to me, that doesn't bother me. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise of God. So Isaiah has predicted that people won't accept Jesus. John explains why. It's not that God has hardened their hearts or keeps them from believing. It's because they have chosen the praise of humans over the praise of God. I hope that the Lord doesn't ask me to preach on this passage. (laughs) Because it would not be a very fun one to preach on. Um, Jesus shouted to the crowds, If you trust me, you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey, for I have come to save the world, not to judge it. But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. Um, This is a, a very difficult passage. It's a very uncomfortable passage that reminds us that we are going to be held accountable for what we believe for what we say. And we have to choose, are we more in love with Jesus or are we more in love with what other people say about us? Because quite honestly, what other people say about us has a lot of effect, a lot more impact on us than it should. But we have to be more in love with Jesus. The crowds did not make the right choice. And we learn from their example. Questions? We're early tonight. Has that ever happened? It's interesting. It's just two chapters this week. There's a lot of stuff in here, but it's not a... It's kind of consolidated into a few key points. Next week, we start reading... And the next few weeks, we'll spend reading the last night that Jesus had with his disciples. We'll start next Sunday, I think it is next Sunday or Monday, with Jesus washing the disciples' feet, that that time of Passover. Um, So it's going to be exciting, too. But this week, as we read, again, recognize how important it is for us to have a relationship with Jesus, how that is spelled out in the story of the Good Shepherd. Um, Recognize... Um, how pivotal Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead was in the in the story leading up to the cross, because he'll rec- he'll reference that actually after the uh, um, this after the triumphal entry. Um, many in the crowds had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and were telling others about it. That was the reason that so many went out to meet him. The reason they had such crowds for the triumphal entry. Because Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And many of these people had seen Lazarus and and had told the story. Then the Pharisees said to each other, Look, there's nothing we can do. Everyone has gone after him. So this is such a critical piece of this story unfolding. Why did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? He was going to die again. But he did it because it was one of those big buttons that he knew that he could jump up and down on to make sure that he went to the cross. He had a plan. He was going to the cross. And he was going to push every button. He was going to perform miracles that would lead him there 
to make sure that he ended up on the cross for us. All right. Well, let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us and for your word. Help us as we read this week to to see your word coming alive. And as it comes to life, may it transform us. May we truly understand what it means to follow you as the good shepherd. And may we trust in your miracle, even when you don't act immediately. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.